Joining me right now is Alberta Premier Daniel Smith. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, Premier. my pleasure. So I just wanted to start off. Bill 18 that you introduced this mm -hmm. week, it is called the Provincial Priorities Act. Uh, you affectionately called it the Stay Out of My Backyard <laughs> Act, or Bill. Um, what is the problem we're trying to fix here? Well, I have to tell you, I'm inspired by Quebec, and I, I have been since I got elected, because what I have noticed with Quebec is that the federal government treats them very differently in areas of their provincial jurisdiction. Quebec will often hear a federal government program announced and say, no, thank you, we will not take your rules, but we'll take your money, and they end up getting these special deals. And so one of the things that I discovered at the last Council of the Federation meeting is they have a piece of legislation that actually requires the federal government to deal with the province rather than skirt around them and go to the various agencies and so inspired by that we decided to pass legislation of our own. At a press conference earlier this week you had said of the 14,000 agreements that you have looked through there are 800 of them that have been flagged as problematic. Mm -hmm. Doing a rough math that's 0.05 percent. Yeah. What is so problematic about them? Can you tell me, give me an example? Sure, I can give you a couple of examples. But I think people should be assured that that means that on most cases, we'll be able to find agreement with the federal government. Because in most cases of joint funding, there isn't any kind of, of policy angle to them that is op opposed to what it is we're trying to do So before Alberta. you give me an example, with that math, some people may say, then why do you need this at all? Well, I can tell you one of the things uh, that where we do have a conflict is on the issue of how we approach uh, a drug policy. They are uh, proponents of safe supply and decriminalization and legalization. We're a, a proponent of recovery. And so we want to make sure that all of the agencies that we support are aligned along that recovery-oriented system of care. That would be one example. The other areas where we're not aligned, quite frankly, is on net zero policy. We want to get to net zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. They want to accelerate that by 2030 or 2035. In a lot of cases, it's not achievable. In a lot of cases, it's going to be incredibly costly. And we do not want them to use their federal spending power to end up creating extra costs on our citizens and going against the policies that we have, which we think is more reasonable to get to a 2050 target. We're trying to work with them to orient around that uh, that joint target. Haven't been successful so far, but those would be a couple of areas we're concerned about. We've already heard some municipalities complain or have some concerns about this because in, in essence, that'll be federal money tied up that they would like to have. What if you have a municipality that has a priority that is aligned with the federal pr the priority, but not yours? Why stand in the way of that? Doesn't that get in the way of municipalities? Well, municipalities get their jurisdiction from us. That's how our constitution is written. There's two orders of government, the federal and the provincial, and local matters are assigned to the provincial government to legislate. And we want our, our municipal governments to be focused on developing infrastructure, water, wastewater, roads, building houses. And we don't want them to get involved in a bunch of, of ideological uh, policies battles. We want them to be focused on the on their knitting, focusing on the things that matter. What this is supposed to do is actually unlock more money. What I've been frustrated to see is that when the federal government comes in and signs unilateral or bilateral agreements with municipalities, they leave almost everyone else out. So we only have eight municipalities that have been successful at getting accelerator funding. We have 350 plus municipalities. We um, also have the rapid housing funding. We, get tw we are 12% of the population in Alberta. My housing minister tells me we've been successful in getting 2% of the funding on a per capita basis. So our hope is that municipalities would receive this in the spirit it's intended, that we want to work on their behalf to ensure that Alberta gets its fair share of per capita funding so that more municipalities can be funded. On the housing accelerator fund, I mean, Sean Fraser's office says that this is not a per capita uh, program. And if it was, the money that's already out there anyways does get up to, a, I think it's about 11.49%, so over 400 fifty million dollars of the fund that is actually going to Alberta but back to the point about what if it does align with let's say Calgary I mean Jody Goddick has already said she's concerned that the provincial government wants to slam the brakes and slow things down uh, to the speed of bloated bureaucracy mm -hmm. you have uh, a minister who's charged with reducing red tape how is this not more red tape well I can tell you how it's not imagine how much red tape there would be if the federal government had to ink 350 separate bilateral agreements but with they're each going directly to the municipalities they're, and they're inking them with the municipalities that say that they want them that these align
align with their priorities and align with the government's priorities. Why stand in the way of that well, if that's money that's going to them? The fastest deal that they had was with Quebec. It was a one-time deal announced back on November 9th. And if they had sat with each premier under those same circumstances, working out a funding arrangement where we could announce and uh, make an announcements together, we'd be well on our way in every province in being able to, to accelerate housing. Instead, they're playing politics. They're coming in, they're identifying winners and losers, they're pitting municipalities against each other, they're being unfair in how they distribute the money, and they're leaving a lot of people out and a lot of municipalities out, and we're going to, to do what we can to prevent that. What do you say to people who are saying that you are playing politics here and that this is just basically Daniel Smith against Justin Trudeau? I have always gone to the table with the federal government in a spirit of trying to work with them in cooperative federalism. I, my very first conversation with the Prime Minister, I told him I wanted to align with the 2050 target for achieving carbon neutrality, and I have kept my commitments with him all the way along. We've got developed bilateral tables, and we're making some progress on some issues. Um, I also dealt with him on the issue of the uh, the health health funding, and that's an, a prime example. They know how to do this mm -hmm. because they've done it with our province before. We sat down, we worked out a 10-year deal, we negotiated for also specific deals on bilaterals, and we got the same per capita funding as everyone else. That's how our province and our country is supposed to work. Why they are choosing to do it differently, I can only think that they're playing politics, and we've had enough of it. It's not fair. We, we are a great contributor to Confederation. We give more money on a per capita basis than any other province. All we're asking is for a per capita share that is equal to other provinces and for them to, to approach us in a spirit of collaboration, and they haven't done that in this case. But you do have municipalities that in your province are not allowed to run a deficit. What if this holds up money that will prevent them from running deficits? Does that mean the province will step up and help those municipalities? All I would say is by my housing minister's calculation, we're about one to two billion dollars short already based on the kind of deals that we've seen written in other provinces. There's a lot of, province, of municipalities facing a shortfall and that's what we're trying to correct. We think that by using our ability to negotiate by having a mandate that they would come and work with us, we think that we'll get our, uh, our per capita share. They have already said in their announcement today that they respect that Quebec has a different model and mm -hmm. they will work within Quebec's structure. And that's because Quebec has that legislation. So we're just asking to be treated the same. With respect, I just wanted to hammer down on that uh, point. If a, if a municipality wants the money, needs the money, will the province step in instead for that federal money that they had wanted and possibly negotiated already or were planning to negotiate? Look, we're, we're not stepping in the way of existing deals. I have said that. But, uh, on, I, I'm but in more future concerned, deals? On, well, I'm, I'm concerned that there won't be future deals. I'm concerned that a municipality doesn't have the lobbying heft and the time um, and the bureaucratic power to be able to negotiate a one-on-one -on -one deal with Ottawa. That's so do you part not have confidence we, in, your, in your municipality? Then? We are the ones with the relationship. I can tell you, we've got 350 municipalities. I've visited a large number of them. I can guarantee you the Prime Minister hasn't, nor has the Federal Housing Minister. This is the reason why, when they drafted the Constitution, they put municipalities and local matters under the jurisdiction of the province, because we have an obligation to support them and an obligation to have a relationship. The Federal Government doesn't, and that's evidenced by the fact that they have only signed eight deals with eight municipalities in my province, even though we have 350 that are left out in the but cold. And that's just not fair. But if I'm doing the math, now you're slamming the door on 342 other municipalities. No, we're going to be negotiating what I hope will be a very similar type of approach that Quebec does. Because we are already have $840 million in money on the table over the next three years for affordable housing. We are intending to build 25,000 units out. We are working with our uh, municipalities to reduce red tape. And we have another number of other measures coming forward. It would be far better. We would be able to truly accelerate home building if you had the federal provincial and municipal governments aligned rather than the federal government stepping in and misprioritizing and not identifying the true need. That's where, that's where we come in and I, I wish that he would uh, wor work with us in that spirit. When you talk about working together with the federal government in the spirit, um, obviously not aligned on uh, what you call the carbon tax, what they call the carbon rebate. Um, you recently in your province just raised uh, or restored the, gra the gas tax in your mm -hmm. province, four cents per litre, um, and you had said that four cents per litre on gas is the difference between running a $400 million surplus and not. You also said once that revenue comes in, you will return it to Albertans. Mm -hmm. 
the feds have that same argument in saying that the money that they get from the climate rebate is actually what they put back out to Canadians. So how is it different for you? Well, we use our, our it's a 13 cent a litre fuel tax. We right. use that for roads and we also brought in a, a new tax on electric vehicles so that they pay an equivalent share. So they'll be paying $200 per year when they register their vehicle because we believe everybody should take part in paying for roads and that's what the fuel tax was originally but intended that also, for. Sorry to interrupt, doesn't that also de-incentivize people to try and buy electric vehicles and go more green? Well, I would say if you're going to buy a vehicle and, and drive on our roads, you need to pay for your fair share of the cost. The problem with the federal approach is they are now taking, uh, charging about 35 cents a litre and their carbon tax in particular, I'm just looking at their own parliamentary budget mm -hmm. officer who says that Albertans are already going to be shortchanged on average $911 this year, growing to about $2,700 that they're shortchanged by 2030. So it isn't a, a rebate and the problem with the, the stated purpose is they say it's going to reduce emissions but I'm not seeing evidence of that because part of the problem when you have a tax like that you have to have a reasonable alternative if everyone wanted to run out and buy an electric vehicle tomorrow there aren't enough electric vehicles being produced there isn't the infrastructure being built. There isn't the home infrastructure to be able to support but are, it. But are you so all it is, all it is, is punitive. That or, sorry to interrupt, but are, are you encouraging that or discouraging that by putting an extra tax on electric vehicles and making it a little more difficult for people to go that way? We're going to be fair. Um, we, we know that, that we're going to see more and more people choose zero emission vehicles. We've got to pay for our roads somehow, so we're trying to create that parity. In our province, we think that the zero emission vehicles are going to be hydrogen vehicles. We have a hydrogen bus uh, uh, pilot project in both Edmonton as well as in Strathcona County. We're working with our Alberta Motor Transport Association, our long haul trucking, on a project that will inject hydrogen into a dual fuel stream so that we can reduce emissions that way. We're working on building hydrogen into our home heating fuel so that we'll mm -hmm. also be able to reduce emissions. And so there isn't a recognition, this is the real problem with the federal government, there isn't a recognition that there's lots of ways to reduce emissions and you don't just charge a retail carbon tax which is punitive. The work that needs to be done is the work of building the infrastructure, working with big industry. It's not serving its purpose, it's punitive, it's harmful, they, especially in, a, in an affordability they've crisis. They've said they're doing that at the same same time in a carbon tax that there has been evidence out there that's saying that putting a price on pollution is the best way to tackle that and I say that because they say that maybe not this year or next year but we do have the um, the wildfires that continue to rage in your province and that needs to be curtailed the wildfire season has started earlier this year and just looking at it earlier on Slave Lake Forest very high risk so there is that need so can't you do it on all fronts well I would say that that we agree in industrial pricing on our, our large emitters, but the retail carbon tax simply isn't working. And you know, if you don't believe me, just ask Jagmeet Singh. He, uh, he's also raising questions about whether or not the carbon tax is, is serving its purpose. So is the Saskatchewan uh, NDP leader. So is uh, sort of some of the leadership candidates in the Alberta NDP. I think what people have seen is that there was an expectation that it would curb be be uh, behavior, but now that it's at a point where it's $80 per ton, we have infl an inflation crisis, an affordability crisis. People are seeing that it's just punitive. It's not fair. And this is the time, if the federal government wants to do something to address affordability, where they would either pause it or take it off altogether. And that's what we're asking for, and increasingly other voices are too. Premier Danielle Smith, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, we appreciate Mike. it.